Alright, so good afternoon everyone. Thanks for coming out today. Glad you guys could make it. So as always, we're going to start off the meeting today with a question to ponder. So raise your hand if you have any ideas, and then I'm also going to bring up some images to help guide this discussion along. So what are spatial or local relationships? Does anyone have like a general idea or suggestion? No, okay, that's totally fine. You, you want to? Well, maybe s spatial is like X, Y, Z. Like I'm sitting here, he's sitting there. Sure. Sitting over there, you're there. Maybe like a physical relation to where things are located in space. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's bring up an image here. So this is a picture of a dog. So. Can you find any, so behind the image are a set of pixels, right? So can we find any local or spatial relationships behind the pixels of this image? You guys have some ideas? Okay, so I have an example of a spatial relationship in this image. So the pixels around this guy's ear can form one spatial relationship or local relationship in this image. All right, actually, we'll start off with his eye. So you know that's one feature of this image. And we also have his ear. So let's bring up a different type of data. So this is an image, right? So what about audio data? Can we find any, now that we have some examples of spatial relationships from this image, can we think of any relationships in this audio data? So you might be able to correlate like certain subsections of this audio wave and find features in relation to time of this audio wave. So like here might be one feature in this audio wave. And then later on in the audio wave, you might correlate a different set of you know, sets of data points, correct? So let's take a different set of data. So last week we were working with standard artificial neural networks. So what type of data were we working with then? Do you guys know the name of that type of data that we were working with? We're, we're working with tabular data. So I think we did like a, an example of a housing data set where we had like the prices of houses and some of the features of the house, right? So that was tabular data. So can we find a spatial or local correlation in this example of tabular data. Let's try. Can you guys like throw an example out there? Let me try. So let me try and like draw one of these circles on this tabular data and see if we can find a spatial relationship between this data. Does, does that make sense? You think so? No, right? Not at all. So you can't just arbitrarily pick data points at like different rows and columns with tabular data and generate spatial relationships. So let's break this down a little bit. So last week we were working with artificial neural networks. What we were doing was finding global correlations in the data. So this tabular data, we we're taking a single row and each of the features in this row, we we're finding some global correlation between all of the features in one row and predicting some data point. So for a house, for example, you might have like the number of bedrooms it has, number of uh, like size of the garage, things of that nature. So you correlate all of these features together into a global correlation of all the data points and predict some outputted, you know, dependent variable. On the counterpart, what we're finding in these images are spatial or local relationships. So what would happen if we found a global correlation like we do with tabular data? in the pixels of an image. Do you guys have prediction of what might happen if we try to globally correlate every single pixel in an image at once? Classify it? Maybe, but what would really happen is if you took all of these thousands of pixels and correlated them all at once, you'd get a bunch of like haze, like gray, right? If you mesh together a bunch of like image data, you just get a bunch of gray. All these different pixel values, you wouldn't get much out. Do you have a suggestion out there? Okay, good take, good take. So in image data, what we can do, image, audio data, all types of unstructured data, is we can find, what we want to find are local or spatial relationships behind the data. So what that means is you can actually take different so let me break down unstructured data first. So first of all, tabular data was what we worked with last week as what we call structured data. So why do we call it structured data? So in the real world, each of these features in a row of data has a real world interpretable meaning. And each different feature in a row are also very, very different in the real world. So like number of a number of cars or garage might fit, like size of the bathrooms, things of that nature. They each have a different interpretable meaning in the real world, and they're all 
very different from one another. So that's structured data. Examples of structured data are like CSV files, Excel files, tabular data in general. On the other hand, this is what we call unstructured data. Examples of unstructured is images, audio waves, etc. The difference between unstructured and structured data is that each of these pixels in an image, if you take a single pixel out of this image, what does it mean on its own? Nothing. It's just an arbitrary pixel value. Now, what, what could what happen if you took a single cell of data out of this Excel file? That actually makes sense in the real world because it's structured data. That feature that you took out actually has a real world interpretable meaning. Unstructured data, if you just arbitrarily picked a pixel out of here, you would get nothing from it. That's why we need to find local correlations between different subsets of the pixels in the data. So we like sort of understanding the difference between unstructured data and structured data and the difference between a global correlation and a local correlation. A little bit intuitively. Yeah? Okay, let's keep moving forward. So yeah, this doesn't make any sense, right? So how do we extract these global or sorry, local or spatial correlations behind data? The answer is convolutional neural networks. So we're gonna be unpacking how these how this subset of neural networks works and how it functions to extract features from data and ultimately classify or perform some sort of prediction task. So first of all, let me uh, break down like what sorts of problems can be solved using CNNs. So some real world examples here. So due to the nature of CNNs, because they're extracting these local correlations, they can be applied to all kinds of unstructured data. So like we explained, unstructured data might include audio data, Another really interesting example of unstructured data is actually text. So for example, if you took a single letter out of a sentence, what does that mean in the real world? Nothing, it's a single letter. You need to actually locally correlate different words into, into uh, sorry, different characters into actual words to be able to interpret the meaning of this large <coughs> sentence, right? So again, text, we need to find local correlations to interpret the sentence. You can't correlate all of the characters of the sentence. That would make no sense. You need to find those local correlations, e.g. the words in a sentence. And also, so that's called natural language processing. So probably the most common unstructured data that you would apply a CNN to is image or video data. And so this subset of machine learning is called computer vision. And so computer vision in general is applying machine learning or deep learning techniques to interpret uh, image data. So within computer vision, there are a couple of different tasks you can perform. So the most basic of this is image classification. So if you've probably heard of this, like taking an image of a, or of a dog or a cat, trying to predict what it is, you know, a dog or a cat, things of that nature. That's image classification. You can also have like object detection, where for you want to actually find each of the objects in an image and draw a bounding box around it, for example, so you can actually localize the object within the image. So these are some types of problems within computer vision but there are many, 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 many more. You know, so the CRCV here at UCF, the Center for Research and Computer Vision. So there's an entire research center for this one field of machine learning. So here's an example of image classification and object detection combined. So you were finding these local correlations behind the data and that allows us to interpret in one group of pixels what object is present there. So we're creating bounding boxes around each image and then we're predicting a label for it as well. So classification on top of detection and localization. So just to give you guys a bit more examples, this is part of the research that I did in the CRCV. So at, uh, at the top here, there's a video stream of a car driving along a street and the bottom is an output of a convolutional neural network. And what this CNN is doing is predicting a depth value for each pixel in, this, in each image of this video. So an image is a bunch of frames or images stacked together, and that's a video. So for each pixel at each frame in this video, we're predicting a depth value for it. And this is done using a single CNN. So this, this is a really, really powerful architecture. You know, this is very different than classification or detection. Yeah, to look at how robust it is. So really cool application. So if you extend this work that I did in the CRCV and apply other things like detection, classification, et cetera, you can make a self-driving car, like almost, right? So this is more or less what Tesla's autopilot sees when it's driving along the road. So we're, we're finding bounding boxes around objects, we're predicting what that object is. Each object is, uh, predict we're predicting the, the velocity and distance away from that object that the camera is at. So this is putting together a, di a bunch of different tasks within the field of computer vision into one architecture, and this is what we get. 
So really, really powerful models, really robust models, lots of opportunities with these models. So let's break down how a CNN works now, shall we? So the basics. So last week we talked about uh, artificial neural networks. So you have a set of weights which interact with these nodes in a neural network. Right, so in CNNs, we also have weights. However, weights in a CNN, now we call them filters or kernels. And these filters are used to extract features from your data. So you can also think of features as these local correlations behind your data. And these filters are built to do exactly this, find these spatial relationships behind your data and extract these features from an image. So the way these filters or kernels extract features from an image is through a mathematical operation called the convolution. So I'm going to break down what this convolution is. So this yellow 3x3 three three box sliding across the image, which is this gray matrix here, this yellow is the kernel, the green is the entire image. So each of the weights in this kernel are multiplying each corresponding pixel in the image. So when it moves back to the top left, we have nine different values being multiplied together. So it's an element-wise operation. The filter sits on top of this image, and each of the nine values that, they, that overlap are multiplied together, and you add up all of those nine values into a single value. That outputted value is what's called an activation in, in deep learning. So again, the output of this nine element-wise multiplication is a single activation. So see how it just started? Every time the, the filter moves over one pixel, we get an extra activation. And so we're building, we're building up what we call feature maps. And so this outputted, this outputted feature is a feature map. And this represents some arbitrary feature that was present in the image. And you can guess that the larger the value is in the output of the feature map, the more strongly present that feature was in the original image. Any questions? Sure, so right now, feature is very abstract. So perfect question. We are going to give you some context. Now, so what are features and how are these uh, filters actually extracting these features? Right now, I just showed you like some arbitrary image, really just a matrix of a bunch of ones and zeros, and it's extracting some feature. So what does this actually look like in practice? Let's take a look. Go ahead. So this website that we're about to visit is a really good visualization of convolutions and displaying how a CNN actually extracts its features. There you go. Go up a oh, little bit more. Sorry, yeah. I missed it. Right there is perfect. All right. Okay. So at this left side here is the original image, and this is the kernel that we're using to extract features. Can we go ahead and do the top sobel? Yep. Which one is that? The yeah. very bottom. Okay. This one? Yeah. Okay, so what this kernel here, this is called a top Sobel kernel. And so you see how the top row of this kernel has all positive values, the middle is all zeros, and the bottom row is a bunch of negative values, right? So this kernel is designed to extract top edges from an image. So a top edge is an example of a feature you might extract from an image. You also might want to extract left, uh, uh, left edges or top left uh, uh, corners, et cetera. So they build on top of each other. So let's see how this, like really just a bunch of seemingly arbitrary numbers can actually extract top edges from the image. So if you place the kernel right on the top edge of his hairline here, there. Right there? Yeah. yeah. So this, again, this is a nine element, there's, it's a three by three kernel, elementally wise multiplying this three by three area of the image and this Three, this convolution, this single operation outputs a single activation. Can you see it there? It's a 845. Can you see my dot there? That yeah. little square is the output of this convolution. So you see here, right now, there. so first of all, in an image, the white values are larger pixel values. The black ones are lower pixel values. So a totally black pixel is zero. A white pixel is 255. So if you put it on the bottom of this forehead here, we see that all of these positive values in the kernel, the one, two, and the one, are multiplying black pixel values in the image. So this is the operation that's actually happening here in the middle. So as you can guess, if the positive values multiply these very low black pixels, and the negative values are multiplying 
the wider parts of his forehead, what's the output of that activation going to be? A really large activation or a really low activation? What would you guess? Really low. Really low, right? Because the, the positive values in the curve are multiplying really low values in the image, and the negative values are multiplying high values in the image. So if you add them together, you get a really low activation. The reason for that, why this big part of the image is all black, is because right here there's no top edge. There's actually a bottom edge, but there's no top edge. So if we place the kernel on the very top here, all of a sudden the positive values are multiplying white values, and the negative values are multiplying the smaller black values. And we see here that represents this top edge we're seeing here. I switched it to bottom now. Oh, okay, so now yeah. it's extracting the bottom edge on his forehead. So you can so see how it's switched. Are you seeing intuitively how a kernel can extract the feature now, just mathematically? Pretty cool stuff, right? So, are you good on this? Yeah, that's okay. okay. So that hopefully provides like some intuition how convolution extracts a feature. Now, those kernels, we were predefining them. Like we said, let's build a top Sobel kernel, and let's build a bottom Sobel kernel, right? But in practice, Training a CNN involves using gradient descent, which we talked about last lecture, to find optimal values in each of these filters. So when you're training a CNN, you're not telling it which kernels to use. It's actually learning which filters to use, which kernels to use. So it'll teach itself, first I need to extract top and left edges, and then I'll put them together and extract corners, until these filters are actually extracting really complex features like ears and eyes, but using that same mathematical operation called the convolution. And a well-trained CNN will have learned to extract very specific features that are specific to a certain data set. So it has to be able to extract them, and then given these extracted features, predict what type of image we're looking at, for example. So if a CNN is looking at a picture of a dog, and it finds it, it's, it's extracted like something that looks like dog ears and a dog tail, it'll classify that as a dog. So intuitively, that's how a CNN works. Uh, let's explain how this works in practice. So, so far on that website we looked at, that image was black and white. So a black and white image is a single 2D matrix. There's no, three, there's no third dimension to it. In practice, most images are colored now. And they have, the in image ex itself is now made up of three channels. So it's really three matrices stacked together along the Z dimension. And each channel in this image represents a different color. So that's where red, green, and blue comes from. So if you have some colored image really behind the scenes, what it is are these three matrices stacked together. And when you sort of combine them, we have like some really like complex uh, color scale on this image, right? So if images now are three channels deep, and image is 3D now, we also need to have our filters be 3D. We can't use that 2D 3x3 three three kernel anymore. But why is that? Intuitively, why do you guys think if we have 3D colored images, why would we need 3D filters? Because like, um, you're going to make sure like all the values are more or less the same. So you're going to account for like all the, like the different color values for red, green, and blue. Exactly. So maybe let's say we're trying to build a CNN to classify frogs. So we can't use a single filter to multiply the red, green, and blue channel in this image. If you use the same filter, you're extracting this, like the same green features as you are blue and red features. And what you really want to do is have a three-dimensional filter where the, the green channel in this filter is extracting very prominent green features of this frog. So you want to build a uh, filter that extracts green features if you want to classify frogs. So intuitively, that's why we need these 3D filters now. So before, in a black and white image, the, a single convolution is this a multiplication of nine values, and then you add them together into a single activation, right? So now, in the 3D space, in the colored image space, one convolution is now the dot product of 27 different values. So three by three by three in the, chan in the color dimension. Does that make sense? So let's visualize it. Here we have the image. So this is really what an image is. It's the red, green, and blue channels, and we have a three-dimensional kernel. So this kernel will sit on top of this image and multiply 27 different values together. Can you guys see the 27 different values? The nine on the, in the blue channel, the nine on the green, and the nine on the red. That's 27. And those 27 values are still added up into a single activation. So that would be here. This is not working that well. But that would be this guy. 
that single activation. So the outputted feature map, even if we're using these 3D kernels, is still one channel deep. Does that make sense? So this filter is still extracting a single feature, and it creates a single channel feature map. So, so far we're using a single uh, kernel. So each kernel will only extract a single feature from an image or any type of data you apply it to. So, so far we talked about images. All these operations can be applied to, for example, audio data or even text data. But how do we extract additional features? You know, just extracting all the top edges from an image is not going to be enough to classify it. We need to extract more features and really more complex features. So how can we do this? Well, we just apply more filters. So the resulting 2D feature map, so again, we said that each kernel outputs a single feature map. So if we apply 10 kernels, each of the 10 feature maps are stacked in the Z dimension into a 3D output output. So let's visualize that also. So each channel in the output essentially represents a different feature. Is this, is this making sense? So we have basically this kernel convolves across this entire image and it outputs the first uh, feature map. We then apply the second kernel and it does the same thing, convolves across this entire image. However, it outputs its own feature map. So these two kernels, we take the two feature maps they outputted and stack them like this. So we're creating another 3D output. So now, rather than each channel represented, representing the different colors in the image, each channel now represents a different feature. So if this first kernel was, out, was trying to extract top edges, this first feature map represents where all of the top edges were present in the image. And if the second kernel is, out, is uh, extracting like you know bottom edges, the second feature map in the 3D dimension here, in the Z dimension, represents that, all the bottom edges. And that process makes up a single convolutional layer. So we said that neural networks are made up of these layers of linear layer and then nonlinearity and then another linear layer and nonlinearity. So the same process applies here. So this process of, process of applying an arbitrary number of kernels to the image is one convolutional layer. So we see here that we've just done one convolutional layer and our output is a bunch of feature maps, specifically 16 feature maps. Do you see why? Because the Z dimension is like 16 units long. So if we have 16 feature maps stacked together in this 3D output, how many kernels do we have to use? 16. 16. So again, each kernel is extracting a single feature, which, represents, which, is, which is represented in a feature map, and we stack them. So the output of this convolutional layer is this 3D stack of feature maps. So we're going to get into this in a little bit, but we'll later learn that the earlier layers in a, convol in a convolutional neural network extract really simple features. But this process of stacking them will allow us to extract increasingly complex features. So let's see how. So this is the output of our first CNN layer. So this output of the first layer is obviously fed to the second layer. The following layer performs, again, channel-wise convolutions on all of these feature maps simultaneously. Again, the kernel depth, similarly to when we had a 3D image or a colored image, RGB, we needed a 3D kernel, one channel for each color. Now, again, if we have multiple feature maps stacked together, so in this example we have 16, we need the kernel depth to match the previous layer's output depth. And it'll make a lot more sense when I show you a picture. So if we have 16 feature maps stacked together, what do you guys think? How uh, deep do these filters need to be? 16. Yeah. So this allows the model to extract increasingly complex features. But how, right? Like that. So think about it. Again, we, we mentioned that each of these channels in this first outputted uh, feature map stack represents a different feature. So if these kernels are now convolving across all of these uh, channels simultaneously, what you can do is essentially stack together, stack together different features. So intuitively, you might think of if this first channel outputted the top edge and the, the channel behind it outputted all of the left edges, the second layer can now look at those combined and now it can extract all of the top left corners. Is that making sense? And they can do that because we stacked all of the feature map and these kernels are convolving across all of the channels simultaneously. So it has a knowledge of all of the features that were present in the image so far. 
So now we're extracting things like corners, things of that nature. So let's visualize what's happening. So, so far I've talked about like top and left edges and corners, but none of these are very complex features. Again, if we can extract all the corners in an image, that's still not going to do very much for us if we want to decide if something is a dog or a cat. So let's visualize what's happening in a fully trained CNN, in a large, deep CNN. So I explained that in general, filters in the earlier layers of a CNN extract simple shapes or gradients. So this paper by Matt Zeiler and Rob Fergus, the entire goal of this paper was to visualize what a CNN is learning and how is it extracting features and what, is, what features is it, is it extracting. So on the left side here, this, the left side of all of these slides are going to be the kernels th themselves. So here are actually nine different kernels. And then the output are a bunch of areas in an image that were highly activated by these filters. So we can see in the first layer, the, the kernels seem to extract, again, very simple features. So we have things like lines or color gradients, things of that nature. And you can see here, like take the, the bottom right gradient here, it's like some sort of like a pink to green gradient. These are all of the parts in the image that were highly activated by that filter. So this filter was more or less built to extract things like this. So like color gradients. So by layer two, now we've extracted all of these lines and color gradients, and we can actually put those together to extract more complex features. So by layer two, you see how much more complex the kernels are. Now we're extracting things like, like I said, top left corners, or circles, or like really complex patterns. So you see the corner filters. These are the types of images that it activated. Does that make any sense? So like these are like windows, circles, complex patterns. So we're increasingly, like we're uh, adding complexity to these filters. So again, by stacking them in the 3D dimension, we can extract more and more complex features. So by the third layer, look at how much more complex we're getting. This filter can actually extract human heads. I think this one is doing maybe like birds or bird noses, even more complex patterns. And you see here the types of images that it activated. So we're actually being able to localize and find like entire humans now or birds with only three CNN layers so far. So let's keep going. By layer four, you see the trends continue. More and more complex features. So now we're extracting dog faces. What else is going on here? This is like animal legs going on here. And by layer five, we're not only extracting dog faces, but we're extracting very specific features from a dog's face. So here, we're extracting eyeballs. I guess these are like bird eyes wheels from bicycles. Yeah, so these are dog ears, dog or cat ears it looks like. So you see with only five CNN layers how complex we're able to get, right? These filters are now not extracting things like top edges or corners. They're extracting entire features from someone's face, eyeballs, ears, etc. So this is how CNN works. So. Hopefully, you guys have some intuition now of how a CNN extracts these features by like extracting very simple features, stacking them together, and then using this combined knowledge of simple features to extract more complex features, right? So before we get started with the workshop, we need to go through a few more details, because there's a lot of parameters you can play with in CNNs, a lot of things you can like manually change or play with as you're creating your own custom CNN. So the first thing you can, that can change in a CNN's layer is the, conv the convolution stride. So the stride is the number of pixels the filter skips after each convolution. So, so far we saw how a filter would slide across an image and it would move over one pixel at a time, right? That's a stride of one. So you can increase the stride to reduce the output dimensions and the computation required. Why? So if you think about it, if you have a three by three filter and you're sliding it across this arbitrarily large image, it can only fit into the image so many times until it slides off the image and you gotta stop. But if you increase the stride so you start skipping two or three pixels at a time, is it gonna fit into the image more or less times? Less times. So, what, so if, it's filtering, if, if it's fitting on the image less times, we're gonna extract less activations and less features. That makes sense? So the output of the feature map is going to actually have a physically smaller size in terms of the width and the height of a feature map. 
A smaller stride allows you to capture the finer details and relationships behind nearby pixels. So if you have a large stride, you're really skipping over a lot of the rela relationships behind the pixels in the, in the image. Whereas if you keep the stride to very small, you're really like making sure you're capturing all of the fine details behind the image. Before we get going, I want to show you like mathematically why a larger stride reduces the output dimensions. So with a stride of one, we have a seven by seven inputted image and a three by three kernel. So this, the, in this case, the kernel can only fit in the image five times horizontally and five times vertically. So it outputs a five by five output in feature map. But what happens if we increase the stride to two? All of a sudden, the output volume is reduced to three by three, simply because it doesn't fit in the image as many times. So our feature map itself is smaller. And this can be a good thing for CNNs because of, in really large CNNs, you have a ton of parameters, a ton of features you're extracting. So sometimes it can help to just reduce the feature map size physically, and that reduces the amount of parameters your entire network has. Does that make sense? I hope so. Okay, so we just talked about stride. You can also pad your input. So conceptually, you can think about an uh, image in which the filter doesn't fit across perfectly. As you're sliding it across, at some point, some part of the filter is gonna hang off of the image. Can you guys visualize that? So how would you deal with that? If you start sliding it across, and all of, this is, all of a sudden, like two columns on the, on the filter are hanging off the image. Well, you can just pad the image. So there are a couple different like, options when you're padding the image. You can do zero padding, so you'd simply pad the edges of an image with a bunch of zeros. That's one option, a very simple option. You can also do valid padding. So what this does is, as a filter is convolving across the image, if the filter does happen to hang off the edge of the image, or it doesn't fit anymore, you just forget about it. Just don't try it. Just keep going, drop those, drop those uh, activations off. You can do reflective padding, which pads the, out, the outer edges of an image with their reflections. So if you think about it, if you were to just add a bunch of zeros to the output of an image, you're really like drawing a bunch of black lines on the outside of this image. So that's going to really mess up your features on the outside of your image. Like your CNN is literally going to think that for some reason there are these black corners on the outside of your image and extract those. So with reflective padding, it's a much more intelligent way of padding your image. And you can usually like decrease the amount of strange, act uh, strange features you're extracting on the edges of your image. So what about an activation function? And last week's neural network meeting, we said how, we talked about how uh, fitting together a bunch of linear layers followed by nonlinearities allows a neural network to arbitrarily approximate some given function. So in the CNN, we have to use the same sort of idea. We still need these nonlinearities in order to break up these linear layers. Again, a convolution, that, that uh, process of sliding across and multiplying some filter, that's a linear operation. So that's our linear layer, the, the convolutional layer. So following a convolutional layer, we still need an activation function. And this is what allows our model to approximate relationships behind data as described in this universal approximation theorem. So this fancy theorem, all it says is that if you attach a bunch of linear layers followed by nonlinearities and then another linear layer, another linearity, another nonlinearity or activation function, it allows your, your network to arbitrarily approximate any function. Is really all it's saying. But we need those nonlinearities in between linear layers. So reintroducing the commonly used rectify linear unit. So you may have heard this before. This is by far and away the most commonly used activation function in CNNs. And what it does is simply replaces a every negative value in a feature map with zero. So you can think about how at the output, the end of one convolutional layer, you have all these feature maps. So if you were to apply a ReLU to it, all it does is go through every activation, and if it's negative, just set it to zero. So you're just taking the maximum between the activation, the input, and zero. So it's a very, very simple activation function, and for some reason, it works amazingly, by far the best. So in practice, when you're building a CNN, use ReLU after all of your convolutional layers. So some reason is I probably couldn't explain, or I'd probably get it wrong explaining why ReLU works, but in practice, it's just shown to give us the best results. So uh, what's the so word? It's, well, it can't really be proven why it works well. It's mostly just. Yeah, just. Yeah, a, it's just 
just works, and so it, yeah. it works well, and that's why it's been. You know, it's one way of getting away from yeah. yeah. So just in practice, go with you know the top researchers in this field's opinion. Just use ReLU. It's been shown to work the best. So another type of layer, so far we've discussed like these linear layers or your convolutional layer and your activation function or your nonlinear layers. So there are a couple different types of layers you can apply to a CNN in order to make it more robust and generalize to different data it hasn't seen before. So the first of which is what's called a pooling layer. And what a pooling layer does is it applies a statistical function to the contents of a sliding window across your input, so generally an image. So the same way a convolutional layer uses this window, a pooling layer does something similar, and you'll see how. And what it does is it performs something called downsampling, which again reduces the size of your input and total parameters. So the same way increasing your stride reduced the size of your output of the feature map, pooling will do the same thing. And I'll show you how in a second. And what it does is, as I said, enables your model to generalize across varying orientation or scales of input. There are different type, a few different types of uh, pooling layers. There's max pooling, average pooling, and global pooling. We'll talk about each of these. So here is an example of an image. So I talked about padding, first of all. So this image has been zero padded on the bottom and right side of it. So that's an example of padding. And pooling, our, our pooling layer, is what each of these boxes are doing. So it's again using the sliding window. However, in a pooling layer, the sliding window is never overlapping. So you apply this, this window and move it all the way over until it's not overlapping with any values it previously worked on. Does that make sense? So in max pooling, what you would do is look at each of these two by two areas in the image and replace it with just the maximum value in that two by two area. So this first max pooling window, we have like two, three, and 1.5 in it. This isn't working too well, but can you guys see the top left? The blue pooling window? So the output of that blue pooling window is three, because we're doing a max pooling. You can also do an average pooling, which would just average all the, va all the activations in that window. So what is this doing for us? One, I mentioned that it does downsampling. So once you've pooled, applied a max pooling, all of a sudden this feature map is reduced to three by three rather than five by five. So that's the first thing. So again, that's very good for us, because in a lot of CNNs, they get to be very deep. We're, ex we're extracting like thousands of features. So in e the output of each layer is a thousand layer channels deep. So what you want to do is, ah, do I have a marker up here? I don't. Yeah, I, I got you. you can intuitively think of it like this. If you're extracting a bunch of features but leaving the feature maps their same original size, your model is going to have, so like the first, the, the layer, layer one might extract 16 features, your next layer might extract like 32 features, etc. And by the end, by your 10th layer, you might want to extract like 1,024 different features. So what would happen is if you're pooling, hmm, screw it. If you don't apply a pooling layer, these feature maps are going to stay the same size in terms of their height and width, but you're going to have a thousand of them. So it's a ton of literally just values in your scene and a bunch of parameters. So what you can do is max pool. So as you, your model gets deeper or you extract more and more features, you want your feature maps to get smaller. So this one's a bit, this one's a bit smaller than this one. By the end, you might want to have really, really small feature maps. So you can have room in your model to extract more features in the Z dimension. But I think the most important thing that pooling layers does, does is it enables our model to generalize across varying or orientations or scales. So if you think about it, let's pretend that this uh, output of the feature map is representing, let's say, like left hands from an, an image containing a human. So if you don't apply max pooling, again, the larger the activation, that, that means to us that that feature was very strongly present in the image. So if this represents a left hand, where was that, where was that left hand probably present in the original image? Probably where this, like, s this group of like five, seven, is, you see it right there? That group of fives and sevens? So the left hand was probably like somewhere down here in the image. So if you don't max pool, what this model is going to do is memorize, okay, if I see a left hand present exactly here, I'll classify that as like a, a left-handed human, whatever. 
But if you don't max pull, it's going to memorize that the left hand needs to be in exactly that position every time. And you don't want that. You want your model to generalize across data it hasn't seen. So what you do is if you take all the values in a window and take the maximum value, what that is doing is intuitively saying, OK, the, the left hand doesn't need to be right here every time. It can be in this general vicinity. And we're going to extract the maximum activation so it's still represented as you move forward in the network. So you're, allow, you're allowing your model to generalize across different scales. So the left hand is going to be here every time. It can just be in this general area, and our model will still find it. Intuitively, that's sort of what a pooling layer is doing in terms of generalization. We have a few other regu regularization techniques. So these techniques will allow us to reduce overfitting. Does anyone not remember what overfitting is from our previous uh, meetings? Forget about overfitting? OK. Overfitting is pretty much just memorizing your data. So if, you're, if your model is overfitted, it can't generalize to data it's never seen before. We want to reduce that effect. So dropout is one of the easiest ways to reduce overfitting. And what dropout does is looks at a single feature map and just randomly, arbitrarily chooses values to just throw away. It'll just throw away some activation and just set them to zero. So intuitively, what that is doing is saying, randomly, every image you look at, it's going to pick different random features to drop or activations to drop. So sometimes, you might drop that left hand out of it completely. So the model still needs to be able to say, this is a human present in our image, so long as we found its head and its feet. We don't need the left hand, too. The next time, you might take a different image, overfit or drop out, might randomly drop out like the head activation. So now we haven't found, the model can't look at, or doesn't know that a head was present, but it still has that left hand and feet. So basically, at every image it looks at, it looks at and every epoch it trains, it's randomly dropping different activations. So it's just introducing like a large variance or just randomness into your model. Another, another technique is known as batch normalization. And what this does is normalizes the activations in a feature map. So what normalizes means is it just transforms each value or each activation so that all of the activations in a feature map have a mean of 0 and a variance of 1. And that is known as the normal distribution, or the Gaussian distribution. So you're normalizing your data at every feature map in the convolutional neural network. And that has been shown to stabilize the learning process and reduce training times. And here's the, the red here in the graph is the lost landscape of a network train without uh, dropout, or without back normal, I'm sorry. So you see that the loss is spiking up and down, up and down. It's still generally trending downwards, but it's very unstable, it's learning process. The reason is, is that every image it's looking at has a slightly different distribution of pixel values. Does that make sense? You might have some images that are inherently darker than others and have a distribution skewed towards the left side. Or vice versa, it might have a really bright image which is skewed towards the bright pixels. So if you just normalize it, your network is looking at more standard data every time and allow it to train much smoother. So you see here in the blue, this is using batch norm, and the loss isn't spiking anymore. Okay, those, are, those are two really great techniques. OK, so, so, so far, every layer we've talked about is in the feature extraction portion of a CNN. In this portion of the CNN, it's trying to just extract all of the features possible from an image. So at this point, how can we go from, OK, we know what all of the features are in this image. We know we found a head, feet, and left hand. How can we take that and actually use those features to predict what the model is seeing? That is what's called the classification block. The classification block takes in all your features and, extract and outputs predictions. So this is what the output of one feature extraction block might look like in a neural network. So in this case, the network has extracted 512 different features, each represented with a different feature map in the Z dimension. So we just somehow take this 3D output and turn it into an array of predictions. So you remember in our last week's meeting, what a neural network will output is an array of really uh, probabilities, where in this case, this model will be predicting a probability of 37 different classes. And there should be one probability that's generally higher than the others, and we just we output that class, basically. So in this case, this model has 37 different classes it's training on. Each of these values in this vector represent the probability that that image was part of that class. 
But how do we go from this 3D shape into this vectorized shape? It's the last thing we need to solve here. So, okay. When we think, when we uh, think about last week's meeting, what was what did we apply in the last layer of our neural network to output these predictions? Does anyone remember? It's just a simple, fully connected layer, a general artificial neural network layer, followed by one of our final. Was it sigmoid? Yeah. We applied sigmoid. There's also softmax. So we're going to talk about those in a bit. But softmax and sigmoid are two of the most popular final activation functions used in neural networks. And those will transform a bunch of features or activations into this probability distribution that we want. But softmax, sigmoid, and that fully connected layer we talked about can only be applied to 2D data. Last week, we thought about the neural network. Was there any sort of representation of 3D data that we, that we looked at? No, you can't apply a fully connected layer to a 3D output. So we need to turn this thir three dimensional stack of feature maps into some 2D array that we can apply this fully connected layer to. So a global average pooling layer is an extremely efficient way to turn this 3D output of feature maps into a vector, which we can then feed into our final fully connected layer and our final activation function. So what a global average pooling layer or a gap layer does is average all of the activations in each of the feature maps. So we have 512 different feature maps, and what GAP is doing is taking each channel of this 3D output and averaging all of them. So now, rather than each feature being represented by this 11 by 11 feature map, it's represented by a single value in this array here. So this array, of course, would be, or sorry, vector would be 512 values long. So one might ask, aren't we losing a bunch of information if we do this? We just threw away all these activations we worked so hard to get. No. Why is that? So intuitively, does anyone have an idea of what each of the values in this vector represent? It's telling us how strongly that feature was present in the original image. So if this feature map was trying to extract left hands, there should be a bunch of activations in that feature map that are very high, really strong activations. So if we average them together, the average of this feature map should also be very high. So we really haven't lost much information. Each of the values in this 512 length vector represent how strongly that feature was present. So we really haven't lost too much information. So at this point, we have like a really condensed version or understanding of what was present in this image. We have 512 features, some of which may not have been present at all, some of which may have been very present. And so now we have this 512 length vector which represents what was present in this image, and that can be fed to our fully connected layer and our final activation function. So we're ready for that. So the rest of this should be familiar to you guys. So the output of the gap layer is then fed through a fully connected layer, which works just like what we looked at last week. Last week, we are looking at fully connected layers, artificial neural networks. So this 512 length vector outputted by our gap layer is then fed through a fully connected layer which transforms or maps these 512 features into 37 different classes. So what's left? What are we missing? This, can we just take this array yet and just output it and say these are what was present in the image, like this, we've classified it yet? No, because the output of this fully connected layer isn't yet a probability distribution. These are just a bunch of values. So these 37 values are a bunch of, they're not probabilities yet. So what we need to do is apply our final activation function. So usually, in general, there are two that you pick from. Softmax creates a probability distribution where each value is positive and all of those values add to 1. So it's a true probability distribution because they're all between 0 and 1 and they all add to 1. And that is used for single label multi class classification. Why is that? So if we have a true probability distribution where all of the values add to 1, that means that that, that image that we looked at or whatever we inputted 
must be one class and cannot be any of the other classes. So that's called single label classification. We want to give this single image a single label. So in that case, you would use the softmax activation function. Another commonly used function is what's called the sigmoid function. So the output of this function will be a bunch of values where each of those values are still between 0 and 1. So they can be interpreted as probabilities. However, they do not add to 1. So what that means for us is that we use these in multi-label, multi-class classification problems. So the output of this is a bunch of probabilities. And we would look through those for 30, whatever, how many probabilities. And we'd say, if the probability is greater than some arbitrary value, usually 0.5, we'd say that class was present in the image. So an example where you might use a sigmoid function is if you're looking at UAV data, you might look at some gigantic screenshot of the ground below a UAV, and you might want to find all of the attributes that were present in this image. So you might want to say, oh, this image had a river, but it also had mountains and plains in the image, which is very different than when we want to classify a dog versus a cat. You can't say, oh, this was a dog and a cat. It's got to be one or the other. So that's the main difference between these two activation functions. And if you look at the function and the graph of each of these, you will be able to interpret why this happens. So at this point, we're done with uh, the slides for CNNs. So let's look at it at a whole. CNNs use these filters and a convolution operation to extract features found in input data. So as you're extracting features and generating these feature maps, you start stacking them. And this stack of feature maps would then be fed to an additional layer, which can extract more complex features, because we all have all these simple features so far. And as the network goes on, we're extracting more and more complex features. So this is what it's looking like. When I said a network is getting deeper over time, and we want to make its height and width smaller, this is what it looks like. So the input starts off as a really big image. And over time, our feature, we're extracting more feature maps, so the network is getting deeper but we're also reducing the spatial dimensions of the feature maps, which is the height and the width of the image. So you see, as you move on in the network, it's getting deeper, but the feature maps are also getting smaller in terms of their height and the width. And that's usually what you want to do in practice. As it's getting deeper, you make it smaller in the spatial dimension, e.g. its height and its width. So you're not like growing the parameters of this network exponentially over time. Once you've extract all of these features, you have to flatten your features into a, into a vector, like we explained which can then be fed to your fully connected layer, and you apply some final activation function. In this case, we're using softmax. Anyone, anyone have questions so far? OK. So that is a high level look at how CNNs work. No questions? OK, so let's look at how we can actually build and train one of these in PyTorch. Um. If any of you guys are going to be leaving uh, soon or anything, make sure to fill out our feedback form, uh, ucfai.org forward slash feedback. Um, it's going to be, it's posted in the notebook too, but just, you know, we would love to hear your feedback on how, you know, how well um, Danny's doing for the, this, uh, the slides portion in our workshop. So we really appreciate all the feedback you can give us. Um, I'm going to go over how to pull up our notebook and then we can get started. Get out of that. Move this one here. Actually, I already have this pulled up, but I'll go back and that. Okay. All right. So let's head over to ucfai.org. So that's going to be our website. Uh, we're going to go, we're in core here. So we're just going to click core, go to this group. And then uh, we're in the uh, Spring 2020 edition, so click that. And then scroll down to our How Do We Give Our Computers Eyes and Ears. And then click uh, Follow Along on Kaggle. And I'll bring up our notebook. So I already have it pulled up, but um, once you do that, this should say Copy and Edit instead of Edit My Car. It should say Copy and Edit. Just click that, and then it'll open one up. You need to have an account uh, with Kaggle, so make sure. Uh, if you create one, you can just use your Google account if you need to. And yeah, um, so I already have this one pulled out. Okay, so let's actually build, train, and make predictions with a CNN in PyTorch. So 
So did, did anyone get the notebook open properly? Everyone good? Cool. Okay, so as always, we start off by importing all of the libraries we might want to use. So we start off with the standard imports, which is like NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, etc. So if at any point you have a question, like don't know what's going on, need an explanation, just raise your hand and we'll stop. Um, but I do frequently run out of time with this lecture on the workshop portion, so I'm going to speed through a lot of like the PyTorch setup and stuff so we can get into the nitty gritty of building and training a CNN. Okay, so all that's happening so far is we're just setting up our paths and grabbing our data from Kaggle, so nothing too special. So let's introduce the data set. So the data set we're going to be working with today is a really popular dog breeds data set. And it has a couple of thousand images of 137 different breeds of dog. So our goal will be, given an inputted image, predict what breed of dog it is. So first of all, this is like a pretty tough question. Like I could not classify 137 dogs with even like 5% accuracy. And this model we're going to show gets pretty accurate. So this is pretty cool stuff. So here's an example of some of the images present in this data set. So just standard images. So here's a bulldog, here's a German Shepherd. So the first thing I want you guys to take a look at is how each image in the data set is differently sized. So this one is sized some way, and this one has a different shape. The image itself has a different height and width. So the first thing in a CNN is every image you input to the CNN, you want it to have a standard shape and size. So you, in PyTorch, you can get that going with what are called PyTorch data transformations. So a data transformation is something you can define in PyTorch that is going to be applied to each image as it's loaded up before it gets fed into the network. So here we're just defining a few parameters. The input size, 224 by 224, is, how we, is the shape we want to resize each image to before we actually feed it to the CNN for training or prediction. So we, we want to resize every image to the standard square shape. So this next code block is us actually creating our, our data transformations. So all this is saying is that you can com you compose a bunch of transformations into a single sequential order of transformations. So the first thing we do is resize the image to that standard shape, and then we convert it to a tensor, because it's read in as a NumPy array, and PyTorch needs the image to be in tensor format. This two tensor format will also transform uh, every pixel value to be between the range of 0 and 1. So typically, an image, the pixel values are on the scale of 0 to 255, where 255 are the bright values. The issue with that is if you input an image just like that into the CNN, is that those bright values, those values near 255, are weighed so much more heavily than the low values that the network won't train properly. So what we do is just literally divide every pixel by 255 so that every pixel is between 0 and 1. And two tensors doing that for us. And then we also normalize our data to be a normal distribution before it's fed to the network. So those are our data transformations. The next thing is to define our PyTorch data sets and data loaders. So you guys should have had a good introduction to these things in previous week's uh, meeting. So if you have questions, ask, but I'm going to go through these cells pretty quickly so we can get into the CNN stuff. So the first thing we do is create this abstract uh, PyTorch data set for, each of the, for the training, testing, and validation set of data. And we can also create data, PyTorch data loaders, which look at a data set and load up batches of images for us on the fly. So rather than loading an entire data set onto our RAM at once, we can load up 32 images at a time feed them for training, and then load up a different set of 32 images into the RAM. And data loaders and PyTorch are paralyzed, so it's heavily optimized really quick. So you always want to be using PyTorch data loaders. So here's like an application or the benefit of using PyTorch data sets. So when you create a data set, it has certain inherent attributes. So one of the inherent attributes of a PyTorch, of a PyTorch data set is it has this classes attribute, which allows us to list all of the different breeds that were present in this data set. So here we see the 137. So if you know about dogs, you might recognize these. I don't. So. 
We can also get the size of each data set. So we, hear, we see that we're training on almost 7,000 images, and then our validation set and testing set are around 800, respectively, both of them. We also want to define the device we're training on. So if this doesn't output CUDA, raise your hand, because CUDA means we're training on our GPU, which is what we want to do. Okay, and once you've set up patchwork data sets and data loaders, visualizing your, like visualizing examples of the data set is really easy. So here I've just made like two little functions that allow us to visualize different images in different ways. So here we're looking at images directly from the data set itself. So here's like three random images and you see that they're sized differently. I also wrote a function which actually uses the data loader to load up images. So the data loader, when it's loaded in via this data loader, is when the data transformation is applied. So if I visualize images leveraging the, the data loader, you'll see that in a second here, we'll show a batch of images. So this is what we mean by batches. This is 32 images, all transformed to the same size. So let's get into the bulk of this. So how to define a network in PyTorch. So in PyTorch, a model is represented by a normal Python class that inherits from this master neural network module class. So inheriting from this master neural network class gives us all the methods and attributes needed to train a model. There are only two things we need to override. So if you're familiar with object-oriented programming, that should be familiar to you. So we're going to want to override both the constructor for a network and the forward method. The forward method is what's called when you actually feed an image to your network. It's applied, it's fed to this forward function, and that feeds your image through each layer consecutively. So thankfully, PyTorch already has implemented all of what we talked about. So it has convolutional layers implemented, batch storm implemented, dropout. So building a network is as simple as just leveraging these uh, functions they've already created for us and compiling them together in an intelligent fashion. So my answers are already here, but let's get rid of them and do it together, shall we? Yeah, make sure on your, on your notebooks you delete the raise non-implemented error, because then I'll raise an error when you do it. Uh, where it says raise non-implemented error, you want to remove that so, and put your code here. So we were training this in the background because these models take uh, you know, about like five, ten minutes to train, so we want to make sure we don't run out of time. So I was training these. Okay, so as we said, uh, the first half of a CNN is the feature extraction portion. So let's, let's create three different feature extraction blocks. So in the first block, I added a bunch of comments in describing how I want us to build this model. So for the first convolutional layer, let's think about how many channels the input starts off with. So first of all, what do we want to have in the first layer? What will we start off with? Exactly. So we're going to start off with a convolutional layer. Interestingly enough, PyTorch has that for us. So creating our first convolutional layer is as simple as <coughs> defining, what do I call these? Yeah, good point. Okay, so this is the signature for the uh, convolutional layer in PyTorch. So what it needs to take in is the number of input channels and the number of output channels it wants to output, as well as your kernel size, stride, and padding. So for the input size, or for the input channels, how many channels is this first layer getting taken in? For an RGB image, these three. Three. So what did I say in my comment here? that we want this first layer to extract 32 different features. So extracting 32 features is as simple as telling our convolutional layer that we want to output 32 channels. Let's use a kernel size of 3 by 3, and then we need to define the stride and padding. So I'm going to say let's use arbitrarily a stride of 1. Now what's left is how do we know that this 3 by 3 kernel is going to fit perfectly into this image we feed it into? The answer is likely not. So a technique you usually you like people like to apply is the output of the feature map 
let's try to keep it the same size as the inputted image. So what I've done here is created a function that will tell us how much we need to pad our input with in order to output this certain size of output. So using it as, as simple as calling it and giving it these dimensions. So we said that the input image in this network is 200 by 20, 224 by 224. So if we have this 224 image and we want to keep the output of the feature map the same size, and we're using a kernel size of three and a stride of one, this will output the amount of padding we need in order to keep it in order to output like this 224 size feature map. So if we run it, it tells us we need to pad the image with one, zero on each side. So we simply feed it one. And we've created our first convolutional layer in PyTorch. So again, don't forget to apply your nonlinearity. And that's our first layer, a nonlinear layer followed by the nonlinearity. So let's work on the second block now. So we extracted 32 features in the first block. How many features would this second block or this second layer take in? If the first layer outputs 32, how many does this one take in? And let's arbitrarily say we always want to be increasing the number of features we're, we're extracting as we go deeper into the network. So let's extract, extract double the amount. And at the, in this point, we would need to feed this through that get padding function. But I know that this will work again. I'm just trying to save time here so I don't run out of time. And then you also need to apply the nonlinearity. Now let's get fancy a little bit. Let's introduce a batch normalization layer. So how do we do that in PyTorch? Well, I gave us the signatures. So applying a batch normalization layer in PyTorch, again, is as simple as just using this signature, right? When you're coding this up, don't forget to put a comma after each layer, because what sequential is doing is basically sequentially combining all of the layers we're passing into it. So we basically pass a list of layers, and sequential says pass your input through these layers sequentially. So it just creates these blocks of layers. Yeah, so this sequential, we need a parentheses at the end of it. Good catch. So we would need one here. So this parentheses matches this parentheses with sequential. And all that batch norm needs to do is take in the number of channels it's normalizing. And if we extracted 64 features, we send it 64 features. So nothing too crazy, right? So let's get even more fancy. Let's let our model generalize better by applying a max pooling layer. So specifically, we need to use the 2D max pooling layer in PyTorch. And in general, you want to apply your max pooling layer after your batch norm layer. So you just pass max pool uh, kernel size. Usually a good standard size is a two by two, two by two kernel. What did I say about the way that, uh, max, that pooling layers work? Their windows are never what? Overlapping. So if we have a two by two kernel, what stride do we need to apply in order to make sure this window never overlaps? Yeah, and I know that this is going to require zero padding. So again, just saving us some time here because I know I'm going to run out. And the third block is going to mimic this second block we just created. So we should be good to go. Just make sure I don't forget any parentheses. You don't have to run the model training code, right? Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. So the output of these three 
feature extraction blocks is again this 3D stack of feature maps. So in the slides, what do we do after the after the feature extraction block? The gap layer, right? This global average pooling layer, which averages together all these feature maps into single values, which allows us to transform this 3D representation of features into just a vector. And that's what we want before feeding into the final fully connected layer. So again, global pooling in PyTorch is called ad adaptive average pooling. And if we extracted 128 features with this last block, how many features are we feeding into the first fully connected layer? Uh, 128. So this, we actually want to include two fully connected layers just to make it a bit more robust. So let's have this fully connected layer, which takes in 128 features and outputs 512 of them now. So it's taking in a 128 length vector and creating 512 length one. The next thing I did was add some dropout just to reduce overfitting. Usually you can do like dropout 0.5. So we're literally picking half of the activations and just dropping them every time you look at an image randomly. And then the last thing is we now have this vector 500, we now have this 512 length vector and we want it to output our prediction array. How many classes, how many, uh, what's the length of this prediction array? Well, the number of dog breeds we have. So it takes in this length 512 vector and outputs, it would be a length 137 vector. The forward function is what's called, is if you, if you feed an image into this model, the forward function is implicitly called. So it would be, it would be called and x would be your image. So defining the forward function is as simple as consecutively feeding your input x into your layer, capturing the output, and feeding the output into the next layer. So it's just feed it into feature extraction block one, get the output, feed the output into feature extraction block two, get the output, and so on. Then the, all the features are globally pooled. We need to do a bit of resizing here. And then we feed it to the first fully connected layer, feed it to the dropout layer, and feed it to our final fully connected layer. So not too, too bad, right? Once you understand what functions you're overriding and what those function signatures do, really creating a, a, you don't need to even really understand anything I explained in those slides. It's all built right here for you. So the next thing we do is actually create an instance of the model just by calling this class, our CNN class, and then we define the loss function we're gonna use, which is cross entropy loss. So cross entropy loss is used for this multi-class single label classification problem where we have a number of classes, in this case 137 classes, and, our, and the inputted image belongs to a single class. That's when you use this categorical cross entropy loss. You'd notice that in our model, we actually never applied a soft max or a sigmoid. So what happened? Where's our final activation function? So this loss here, cross entropy loss, actually applies a softmax before taking the loss. So it does it for us. This cross entropy loss is essentially what's called a log loss. So cross entropy loss in PyTorch is a, is a stack of first softmax, then take the loss. So it does it for us. So we don't need to add softmax into the model. That'd be implicitly called the loss function. So then we define the optimizer we're gonna use, which is Atom. So Atom is a, a variant of stochastic gradient descent, which you guys should have been introduced to last week. And Adam will just uh, adaptively uh, change up the learning rate and things of like that. So it's much more intelligent than just basic stochastic gradient descent. So we we'll leverage this naively. So let's just use this optimizer. And we're going to train our model for 10 epochs. And then we also want to place the model on our GPU. So that's what's been doing, done here. So then training our model in PyTorch. For sake of time, this is the exact same training function we leveraged last week. So if you need an explanation of how it's working, I can like, sit down with you guys after the meeting, but this is the exact same process. So we have 10 epochs, and each epoch we go through the data once. So we load up these batches, and each batch is, contains 32 images. So for each epoch, we load up a single batch, feed it through the network, predict the classes, take the loss, use the loss to calculate the gradients, feed the gradients backwards, and update our weights. And that goes on for each batch for each epoch in the network. And it's trained like this. So that's what these two functions are doing here for us. It's just reading in a batch of data, feeding it to the network, predicting, taking the loss, updating the weights, and 
continuing this way. So if you guys just click through all of this stuff, if you define your function properly, we can train one right now. So I actually have the training output right now, but let's see if you guys can get one actually trained up and let's see how it does. I'll probably can't see it. Epic. Before you start training, can you epic for like five? Yeah. Like three, like three so or five. About a minute in epic, so. Okay, that's not bad. Yeah, yeah. We still have a half hour left. It's fine if you want to train it longer, but you can just do it for a few epics. So while you, is, is, is everyone training also? I want to make sure everyone got it built properly. You're training? Nice. Okay, so what are, what are you seeing so far? You can either look at my output or train it yourself. So here we have the loss for each epoch on the training set and then the loss for each epoch on the validation set. And we also have their accuracies. So when you're training a network, you usually want to look at the validation accuracy as a metric of how well your model is doing. So obviously, it's going to do well on the data it's training on. We want to test if it can do well on data it never saw before. So you always look at this validation set. So what do we see here? In the first epoch, without, without this model having learned anything, it has an accuracy of 3%. So it can predict the correct dog breed for 3% of the dogs it sees. And after training for, five e for five, 10 epochs, sorry, we got up to 5.5%. So not, not that good, right? Like why, why is it not doing too well? 10 epochs is not too many epochs, but if you have a good model, it should be enough to learn something. We're really not learning much at all. So why are we not doing well yet? Did it, uh, are you guys still training? Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys want to wait? No, uh, no it's, it's going to take a while. <laughs> <laughs> are you through one yet, one epoch yet? Yes, we got through yes. one epoch. How many are you guys doing, three? Yeah, it, it doesn't really matter. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so here I included some code for you guys to leverage if you want to save your model. Um, not too important for us right now since I already have the output. But in general, what you can actually do is like save your model and continue training those weights later if you want. So I can explain this code to you guys later if you want. Um, but if you run it, it'll actually save your model. And then I actually have a function that loads up your model. So then we actually save it. After it's trained, we save it and then load it back up. So you can leverage these functions if you want to save and load models. If you're ever working at PyTorch, you can literally take my function and use them if you want to save and load models. So I also wrote a function up here that allows us to test the model on images. So it works very similarly to the train function, although we skipped the backprop step. But we're essentially still loading up batches of images and feeding them to the, to the network. So again, we had 5% accuracy. So let's see what that looks like in practice. So like not good. I don't think we got a single dog right. Pretty bad, right? So why, why are we not doing too well yet? So in practice, Training CNNs from scratch is extremely, extremely difficult. Reason being is you need tons of data and very large, powerful networks to get really good accuracy. Like these, even a simple problem like image classification, simple, is very, very difficult for a model to learn. So the CNN we, the CNN we created with like three convolutional layers is extremely, extremely weak. That is not nearly enough layers nor filters to extract the number of features we need to properly classify a dog breed. Additionally, we only have 7,000 dog images. So that's also not enough to train a model. So we can introduce this concept of transfer learning. So in transfer learning, what we do is we take the architecture and weights of a much more powerful network that has been trained on massive data sets for days on extremely powerful hardware. And we'll just take this pre-trained network and leverage it for our problem. So you're transferring the knowledge one model has learned to your problem. So in this case, we're going to load up a pre-trained ResNet model. So ResNet stands for residual network, and it's one of the more popular convolutional neural networks uh, in the industry right now. Extremely powerful. The ResNet 18 has 18 uh, convolutional layers in it. This, in practice, is still not a very powerful network. ResNet 18 is one of still the weaker ones, but we'll see how well it's able to do. So you can actually import a pre-trained network in PyTorch extremely simple by just, uh, I'm not going to scroll up, but you basically need to import the package, the top of your uh, file, and then you can just literally call the pre-trained network and say pre-trained equals true. And now we're, ge we're literally getting this extremely powerful, massive network in, their hand, in our fingertips instantly. It's been pre-trained. 
So this model specifically has been trained on ImageNet. ImageNet is a data set that contains millions of images containing to thousands of different classes. So there's things like cars, trees, humans, bicycles, dogs, cats, etc. So this model has actually learned a little bit about dogs. Only a little bit though. So let's see if we can take this model that has learned about literally everything in the world. ImageNet is like an all-encompassing data set. It has every type of like image possible. Dogs, cats, apples, oranges, anything you can think of. So it's learned a little bit about everything in the world. And let's apply this knowledge to our dog breeds data set. So we've loaded up this pre-trained network and fed it and we're basically just calling it our ResNet variable. So what we do here is we're actually freezing the, each layer in the network. So you can take a pre-trained network and train it some more. However, if you don't have a powerful enough, if, if you don't have a large enough data set or enough time or enough computational power, you'll actually just make it worse. So in this case, we're going to freeze the network, which means is as we're training this network, we're not actually going to adjust the weight of this feature extraction network at all. We're going to leverage this network exactly how it came out of the box. So we give this network and we call uh, this ResNet network our feature extraction <coughs> block. So we, this pre-trained network is doing all of our feature extraction for us. The only thing we need to do is define what? The classification block. So we still need to define how the network leverages these features it already learned about. So, uh, so I know that uh, ResNet, ResNet 18 specifically, outputs 1,000 features. So all I have to do is define a fully connected layer that takes in these 1,000 features and can eventually output my predictions. So the, the classification block is going to have the exact same architecture as our previous network. It's gonna have, we're going to have one fully connected layer that takes in 1,000 features, and then we feed that output to a, a ReLU, and we do some dropout to reduce overfitting. And then we take those features, and we, uh, we feed that to our final fully connected layer. So these two layers, we still do have two fully connected layers that are being trained. So the weights that these layers are changing when we train this network. What's not changing is this pre-trained network. The feature extraction bit is staying exactly the same. So the forward function, because we've actually defined this network in blocks, we have this big feature extraction block, which is really this massive network, and then we have this classification block. So feeding uh, the input through the layers in this network is really easy. We feed the input x through the feature extraction block. So after that, x represents all of these features. In ResNet, it's 1,000 features. And we feed those 1,000 features to our classifier. And at that point, x would represent the probability that our classes, that this image belonged to a, like these 137 different dog breeds. So this bit is exactly the same as above. We just create the model. We're using the same loss function, the same uh, optimizer, same number of epochs, and we place a device on the GPU. So if we print out a summary of this network, you actually see how big it is. So imagine going through and me typing up all those layers. I don't know a lot of the wasted time. If we can just do this, right? And additionally, this network has already been trained for days of days on a much larger data set than we have right now. You guys will have to fill out all of that. Um, to that's true. Yeah, all this. Oh, so, but it's pretty much the same as before. So you know, that's going to be your challenge. So we're going to fill, fill this yeah. out and get the model going. So for, do you guys want to uh, fill this out? I can just keep it up here. We still have enough time. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you guys can get this training on your own? Yeah, where do you need me to go? So I think I had you guys create the, the classification block and then the forward function. Yeah. <coughs>
Okay. Do you guys have the network created yet? Um, no, we just filled out the um, class. The classifier? You guys have this bit yet? Yeah. Okay. So the next thing I had you guys do is instantiate a model. Make sure to call it pre-trained. Yeah, you have to call it exactly pre-trained or the rest of the code will, won't work. So are you guys, are you guys familiar with constructors? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. It's been a while for you. Everyone, yeah. Yeah, so basically when you create a class, this is really just a, a Python class. So when you call this class, it's constructors being called. So you're basically initializing all these layers. Mm -hmm. And their weights all initialized to I think random numbers. And then when you actually say when you actually feed a uh, image or any type of data to your model, that's when the forward function is implicitly called. So that's why you need to actually always override exactly these two functions. So the next thing I did, so the next thing we do is create a class, and then we're going to instantiate our loss function and optimizer. If you want, you can literally scroll up and just copy and paste the code from the previous network. It's the same thing. I guess you would have to call it opt criterion two and optimizer two, or the rest of the, the rest of the code won't work. Just let me know when you guys are done with that part. Good. Everyone got it? <coughs> got it? Okay, so we have the model created. We have our loss function defined, our um, optimizer defined, epochs defined, and we've placed the model onto the GPU. So again, we're ready to train. We're going to leverage those exact same training functions from last week's meeting and above in this notebook. So training the network as, as simple as feeding the, net, the model to the train function and all of your parameters. So this should be filled out for you. So as long as you called all these variables, the same thing I called them, it should work fine. And you immediately see improved accuracy. So we took this uh, pre-trained network, and before, before our uh, classification layer learns anything about how to leverage those features, it's, we're already at 50%. So intuitively, what this model is doing is it's not learning to extract features any differently than what it learned like from the, when, the when the researchers that trained this network were training it. We're leveraging that part of the model exactly how it came. What we're teaching this model to do is how to leverage the features it extracts more intelligently. So we're just training those last two fully connected layers because we froze the pre-trained network the entire way, froze the entire thing. So you'll see here in my output, is everyone training too, or are we getting errors? Uh, I got an error. What's your error? Uh, runtime error, bold value of tensor with more 
more than one value is ambiguous. And I think that it might be based on that one. I don't know how to Any other errors that we need help with? I can walk around if need be. You can go ahead and finish it up. Okay. Yeah, so as you can see, using this pre-trained network, like we get significantly improved results. So after our 10 epochs this time, we're achieving 80% accuracy on this dog breeds data set, which to me is really impressive because how different is some arbitrary dog breed from a different dog breed? Like this model is really extracting very specific features and we didn't even train this thing to. We're just using this pre-trained network that was trained on dogs, but also cars, oranges, like I explained. This image that data set contains thousands of different types of images. So it really hasn't learned anything too specific about this dog breeds data set and we're already getting 80% accuracy. So that's how powerful transfer learning is. So with just these like very few lines of code, you also notice that creating this pre-trained network with less lines of code than our custom model. You know? And we get 80% accuracy. However, there's still a number of different things we could do to even improve this accuracy. So I mentioned that we froze every single layer in this pre-trained network. You don't always have to do that. You could unfreeze any arbitrary layer and actually train that to perform differently. Right. However, in this case, we didn't do that because, first of all, I wanted to show you like, how well it would do without uh, customizing it at all. And also, we don't have, we only have around 8,000, 9,000 images in this dog breeds data set. So if we were to actually trade on this data set, I would guess that we'd actually make it worse. Um, but there is a bit of a trade off between customizing your pre trained network or leaving it totally alone. So let's get into that a little bit and then we'll wrap up the meeting for tonight. So like again, I would save it and then load it back up and it'd be ready to be used again. So I can also like run the model now on some images to see how we're doing. So again, now we're doing like really good. Like did anyone know that this was a often pincher? You, like, like really, really, really good performance. And you can run this over and over, this line, this test model line, and it'll generate, it'll test on random images. So you can generate it again to see how it's doing on different images. Yeah, it did. So I actually have watched like a video tutorial on this exact data set. And it's interesting because if you actually do some analysis on what dog breeds it's getting wrong, uh, like dog breed experts will actually say that those dog breeds were quite similar in the first place. And if you do some research on this data set, you'll actually find that some of the dog breeds are actually mislabeled because some dog breeds can be so similar. So like we're doing really, really well. You know, I bet you if you Google the difference between these different dog breeds, it wouldn't be too, too much of a difference. This next uh, script here, if you train your network and you want to actually enter the competition, if you just run this line of code, it'll create your submission file that you can submit. I'll show you guys how to do that. Yeah. So just a bit of a discussion on how to utilize transfer learning. So this, these two images here sort of describe the relationship between how much you should train your pre-trained model based on the size of your data set. <coughs> so in quadrant run, in quadrant one, we have a, a large data set, but different from the pre-trained model's data set. So we mentioned that our pre-trained model right now, this ResNet model was trained on ImageNet, not on a dog breeds data set. So the dog breeds data set is very, very different from what it was originally trained on. So if we were to train this model a bit further, it would actually learn to extract features that are more specific to this exact data set. So it could become more intelligent. However, there is a trade-off with the data set size, so this is why I chose not to train any of the last layers, because the data set is just too small. I'm pretty sure we'd make it a lot worse. There's not enough data to learn from. But we did explain earlier that the, the final layers in a network extract the more complex features. So that means for us, if you do want to train a pre-trained network a bit further, you always only want to unfreeze the last couple layers. So intuitively, why is that? Well, if this pre-trained network was trained on ImageNet, which has all these different classes, 
it doesn't matter that this data set is made up of oranges and apples and this data set is made up of dog breeds. In the beginning layers, all it's extracting is things like edges, gradients, corners, etc. So it doesn't matter if you were trained on apples, oranges, and bicycles or on dog breeds, <coughs> the model is still learning to extract these simple shapes the same way. What you do want to change is what features, what complex features it's extracting in the later layers. So this model might, one of the, th I explained how ResNet extracts a thousand features by the end of it. One of these features might be like the spokes on a bicycle because it has been trained to classify bikes. So if you were to train the last perhaps two or three layers, it might learn to rather than extract bicycle spokes, it'll extract more things specific to this dog breed data set. So intuitively that's like sort of what's going on if you were to train a pre-trained network further. But you do want to leave the earlier layers, the earlier layers alone because it's, you don't want to re-teach a network to extract corners and edges. It knows how to do that very well as is. You don't need to reteach it to do that. You want to reteach it to extract different features specific to your data set. So that's like the trade-off between leaving your pre-trained network alone or training it a little bit. Or it's called fine-tuning. When you take a pre-trained network and train it a bit further on a different data set, it's called fine-tuning. So if you look at these two images, it'll sort of describe like based on the data set that it was trained on, originally and the new data set you want to fine tune on, depending on how different the data set is and how large your new data set is, it'll sort of tell you how much of the, the network you want to train. Whether to leave it entirely alone or to only train a few layers, or maybe you have enough data and the data is different enough that training the entire network is, was worth it. That's about it for that I had for you guys tonight. So. Thanks for coming out. If you have any questions, like feel free to come up with, to me and Brandon. We both have a lot of experience. Yeah, so I'm going to go over submission real quick, and then we can hang out for a little bit before yeah. our time's up here. Another thing is if you go to the GitHub, this is up there, but there's also an additional file. So that additional notebook is pretty much our slide, but with much in-depth explanation. So pretty much another notebook I have, you'll see it on my GitHub. It has each slide, but like a really in-depth explanation of what like is going on in that slide. So if you need to like reread up on anything that we went over, you can look at that notebook and there's a, a lot a good read in there I feel like. <coughs> Would you mind sharing if I were to just search GitHub and what the repository name is? Um, so if you actually go through our website you can view it right on GitHub. There's a link to do that. I so UCFAI.org. Uh, UCF yeah, UCFAI.org. So yeah I can show you real quick on here. Okay. Yeah if you go to core and then go to like where um, we okay. opened it up on Kaggle. Yeah, so uh, for you to notebook on GitHub. Yep. All right. So for submitting, for, so for submitting for this one, what I recommend. Uh, so you remember when we need to commit our notebook, and when you commit, it actually runs through all your code again. So if your model, you know, if your model, it's going to take like twenty minutes to commit because it's going to train all your models. So what I recommend doing first is going because uh, we're going to be submitting probably the pre-train since that does it better. Um, so you can go ahead and go comment out the. Uh, code for your the training code for the uh, the model that we created uh, from scratch which is right here so you just go ahead and comment that out uh, everything else should run fine you might you might need to comment out the save code or something again we'll have to see uh, but once you do that um, I'm gonna set the training for <laughs> Number of epics of just one, so we'll just take a minute to, to train real quick. Uh, otherwise, it'll take like five, ten minutes, or however long your notebook takes to commit. Uh, once you change those things, you can go ahead and click uh, commit, which uh, what commit does on Kaggle is pretty much just create like a final copy of your notebook that is like with all the output saved and stuff, so it's like your final, like kind of your final draft. Um, <coughs> so this should take probably about like two minutes to run, uh, because it's only training one one thing and once this is done um, you just uh, will click open version and then uh, there'll be a place this uh, to where you're gonna hit submit to competition and you can see how you uh, so my recommendation is, is when you when you go home to mess around with the pre-trained model see if you can squeeze out some more percentage out of that and then submit that to the competition yeah. try on freezing like some of the later layers and see how it affects yeah. your model or maybe make a deeper classifier as well maybe another layer to the classifier that can help too yeah 
or try using like we use <coughs> ResNet 18. You can try ResNet 34 uh, or 50. 50. There's uh, a bunch. 10 something. There's 101. 101. Um, there's also exception. A lot of standard models too. There's also an exception. There's VGG. There's out there. There's a lot of different uh, standard models for like doing image uh, feature extraction. Yeah. Um, out there that you can leverage and see one might perform better than the other. Yeah. So, because ResNet 18 is a pretty small one, uh, 18 stands for the number of like the ResNet blocks in there. It's, uh, you can read up like what what ResNet blocks are, but pretty much what a uh, what a ResNet has is what's called a uh, skip connections. Um, so they're able to like skip to like different layers in the network depending on certain um, attributes. So you can read up more about like how it does that. It's pretty interesting. Um, is this done? No, it's still going. So. <coughs> <laughs> also, our feedback form again, so please give us feedback, ucfai.org forward slash feedback, uh, and give us feedback for this meeting. Uh, that could greatly help us out for next sem uh, future semesters. And the video will be up. Uh, I've been pretty good at getting them up you know, the, the day of and posting them, so it should be up tonight or tomorrow. So, And I'll post that in the Discord. All right. So this is still going. It will take forever. So I'll just show you. Let's see if it'll show. So if you just go to data, um, there'll be a button here. Uh, once you click, uh, once this is done and it's a uh, success, which, oh, I think it just finished. Nope, I lied. Okay, uh, once it says success and this is done, if you click the open version, which is right here, where it says open version, and you go here and click data on the side, there'll be a button here. Uh, there'll be a thing called uh, submission.csv and then a button to click submit. Uh, so, if you guys need to go now, that's fine. But I'll I'll show you once. Uh, oh, there we go. All right. So this will reload. There we go. So now we click data. So it has our fully completed notebook. We can click data, and then this is our the data we submitted. And here's our submission CSV. You can also download your pre-trained model of um, that you saved in in thing, uh, in, uh, in your code. So that's really nice. Uh, Kaggle will also uh, let us have, save our the models that we um, created as well. So you can just click the little download button here. Once you're done, just click submit, and then it'll bring you to the submission. So thank you very much. Thank you guys for coming out. I uh, hope to see you guys next week. Uh, we'll be hanging out here for a few more minutes while we pack up, so feel free to come up and talk to us. But otherwise, thank you for coming. <laughs>